So yes, um, th thanks for the introduction, and uh, I hope it, actually it won't be that dry. Uh, we, it, it's, I mean, it's a number-focused study. Uh, we look at carbon emissions and and, and associate cost and, and calculate um, abatement cost of, of different technologies. Uh, so it's numbers numbers focused, but it, it also has some some policy implication implications, and and I hope it will be interesting for you. And we are looking forward to the. QA session later, in particular the panel discussion. So, I will now introduce you um, into the the background and, and and the motivation of the study in a bit more detail. Um, before then, Amber Kuczynski, who's a consultant in our London office, I am uh, in our Cologne office, uh, will then talk you through the approach and the key results of the study. For either I will then conclude, and later in the panel we will see David Bote, who is a director, again our German offices in Cologne, Berlin. So this is a, a teamwork really, and this is also reflective of how we work at Frontier Economics. So really ac across sectors, like in this case, particular transport and um, energy, and across countries. So as uh, as background, why is it so important that we look at um, carbon emissions and carbon emission reduction from, from road transport? Um, we are all aware of the challenges of um, global warming and the ambitious targets that the EU has set itself to tackle global warming. Um, in particular, by 2030 already, we now need and want to reduce emissions by 55 percent compared to 1990 levels uh, which means that we need to achieve roughly the same emission reduction over the next decade that we have achieved uh, over the last 30 years before uh, so it really needs an acceleration of uh, of efforts across the board really and um, transport is one of the key emitters uh, today with more than 25% of uh, total emissions in the EU and of that road transport is responsible for more than 70% of, of, of the emissions in the transport sectors and uh, you can see here this is uh, mainly passenger uh, road transport and also um, heavy duty and light duty transport and in addition the volume of transport is likely to increase even further uh, going forward, uh, which is illustrated here in uh, in a forecast made by the European Commission, uh, where we see on the left-hand side um, passenger road transport uh, volume that's forecasted, and on the right-hand side the uh, the particular heavy-duty transport with, with quite substantial increases. Um, so to still achieve the climate targets and, and allow road transport to contribute to that, uh, we need a we need to cut down the per vehicle emissions uh, substantially and quickly, and that in turn requires technology options that are scalable and available now. And um, NGVA, as the NSS has, has introduced, asks us to look in particular. Uh, into gas mobility and gas mobility is a technology that is available today and, and also scalable and that holds for, for the vehicle level. So gas fuel vehicles are available and mature uh, pretty much across the board of transport categories. Gas mobility can build on existing infrastructure in regards to transportation, distribution and storage. And um, this, there's also capacity to provide further demand for mobility, which is a, a big advantage uh, over some of, some of the other uh, options to, to decarbonize or defossilize mobility, such as, for example, electrification or hydrogen mobility, where it needs uh, quite substantial expansions of the infrastructure. And then ultimately also fuel supply 
potentials are there for gas mobility. Uh, there is natural gas supply available, which can be used as a kind of bridging fuel, uh, already reducing emissions compared to um, other fossil alternatives such as uh, gasoline or uh, diesel. And in addition, biomethane or even synthetic methane can be used on an increasing scale. So gas mobility is like, available and can contribute to um, C2 emission reductions uh, in the next years already. But EU policy like, often narrows down the perspective to emissions from, um, from the usage of the vehicles um, and as such of ignores or disincentivizes the, comp the contribution that uh, low carbon and renewable fuels can provide. Um, and here in the graph you see uh, the, the life cycle of a vehicle from manufacturing over energy uh, production, infrastructure use and end of life. And um, on, on all of these stages in the value chain, there, there are emissions occurring and, and these occur in different uh, geographies and different sectors. Um, but, but like many policies, in particular the EU fleet targets, as an example, uh, they focus on tape, tape pipe emissions alone in, in something they're called tank to wheel approach. And um, this assigns zero emissions to electric vehicles, and that's irrespective of whether the electricity uh, which with the the vehicles are powered are fossil or renewable um, so so that uh, that's on the one hand side and then combustion engine vehicles such as uh, uh, CNG or LNG vehicles they receive kind of a fossil reference uh, and that is again irrespective of whether the fuel is, is actually fossil or renewable, where there are still tailpipe emissions, but the, the an equivalent amount of emissions have been um, have been bound in the production of the fuel, and and that is uh, ignored in such a narrow tailpipe uh, approach. So this kind of framework is not really reflecting the whole picture, and this and is thus uh, risking that there are biases and, and, uh, and an inefficient transition to carbon neutral mobility. And then there's also um, other stakeholders that want to get rid, for example, uh, of the combustion engine altogether, uh, and irrespective of whether the, the, the engine is fueled with renewable fuels and, uh, or, or the fossil fuels. So in this study here, uh, the aim is to look at emissions and also cost along the whole value chain. So not only at the use, but also at, at emissions and cost occurring in the manufacturing, in the energy fuel uh, production and an infrastructure level. Um, and we do that for a typical passenger car and a, a typical truck and we look at different uh, powertrains, so engines and, and fuels, and we then calculate carbon abatement cost uh, for these, always comparing it to a fossil reference like gasoline or diesel. And this uh, aims to, to gather information bases to allow for cost-effective achievement of climate targets. Uh, so really to see what kind of the the value is in terms of emission reductions uh, that that comes with the money that spends on the economic costs that are associated with these um, carbon emission reductions. So that is the aim and that was the background. And now Amber will talk you through the approach and the key res results. So Amber, over to you. Thanks. Um... Okay, if you go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so as Matthias said, our study analyzes carbon emissions and economic costs for several road transport technologies, which are shown here. 
and we focus on the near term. So all of the emissions and costs that we present here are based on forecasts up to the year 2030. Uh, and we look at some key options for passenger cars and trucks. So for passenger cars, uh, we look at a gasoline from fossil option, uh, a fossil CNG option, uh, a pure biomethane option uh, based on a feedstock mix um, that NGVA um, has provided us with. Then we look at a mix, so a 60% um, fossil CNG and 40% biomethane passenger car. And finally, uh, a battery electric vehicle, which we assume in 2030 is powered on um, the European uh, electricity grid mix. And then for trucks, we also have several options. So we look at a diesel option from fossil, uh, an LNG from fossil. 100% uh, bio LNG based on the same feedstock assumption. Uh, and we also look at a mix of fossil LNG and bio LNG, uh, again, based on the, the supply uh, availability the NGVA would expect for bio LNG in 2030. And finally, we also look at fuel cell um, vehicles. Uh, and for these, we consider um, grey hydrogen, and we also look at blue and green hydrogen. Um, so could you go to the next slide, Matthias? Great. Um, so those are the vehicles that we consider in the study. And then what we do is draw on published studies to calculate um, costs and emissions for each vehicle. Uh, and we aim to take a wider view than the pure tailpipe tank to wheel focus. So for emissions, we look at um, the emissions associated with manufacture of the vehicle, um, the well to tank emissions associated with the production of fuel and its transport to um, the pump, and also tank to wheel emissions associated with the use of the fuel. Uh, and then for costs, we also take a, a, a wide view of costs. So we look at the manufacturing costs associated with um, direct production of the vehicle. Uh, we look at the fuel production costs, uh, the cost associated with transporting the fuel from production to use, and also refueling infrastructure. So by that, we mean uh, the additional refueling stations that would be required to support um, an increase in uh, the different types of vehicles. Um, and sorry, just one thing, one more thing to note on the costs um, that's important to bear in mind as we go through them is that we use economic costs rather than user costs. Um, and that's because uh, what we're aiming to do in the study is calculate the cost of carbon abatement to society. Um, so how much does it cost to reduce emissions uh, by one ton of carbon in economic terms, um, while user costs, so for example, the cost that a user would face um, for different fuels at the pump, um, would take into account different taxes and levies. So here we've excluded all uh, influence of taxes and levies, and we just look at the economic costs. Okay, uh, so go to the next slide. Um, so one quite important thing that we're keen to stress in our study is that there's quite significant uncertainty around how costs and emissions will develop over um, the next decade. Um, so we include ranges for many of the parameters uh, that we look at in our analysis. And here this chart is just plotting some of the different parameters um, in, in terms of how uh, relatively uncertain they are. So some things are relatively more certain, for example, the cost of a, a internal, internal combustion engine CNG vehicle and other factors are less certain. So um, the emissions associated with battery electric vehicles or the cost of the battery production. Um, and what we can see here, the circles are uh, associated with CNG parameters and the diamonds are with BEV. Um, and there are quite a few uh, electric vehicle parameters that are relatively more uncertain given there are less mature technology. So we reflect that in, in our figures. Okay, we could go on to the next slide. So now I'll talk through our main results, starting with cars and then moving on to trucks. 
So starting with emissions, um, this graph is looking at just the tank to wheel emissions. So as Matea said, these are the reference of the EU fleet targets. Um, and this is for our five different um, vehicle options. Uh, and you can see it's a pretty clear picture. So for electric vehicles, um, there are zero tank to wheel emissions. Um, while for gas mobility options, um, they all have the same level of tank to wheel emissions, uh, regardless of whether we're looking at fossil CNG or pure biomethane. Uh, then if we go to the next slide. So what we've done here is kept the tank to wheel emissions, which are the teal bars, but then we also include the well to tank emissions, which is the uh, light blue bar. And we add these together to get a well to wheel total emission, which is the red bar. Um, and so that gives a wider picture um, of emissions across the, the well to wheel cycle. Um, and you can see just looking at the red bars, it's quite a different picture. So now BEV does have some emissions associated with it. So here we've used uh, the emissions associated with the average EU 2030 grid mix. Um, and the different gas mobility options now have quite different levels of emissions. So fossil LNG has relatively higher emissions and pure biomethane has actually negative well to wheel emissions. Uh, and this is because um, there are emissions bound during the production of the biomethane. Uh, and then the mix of biomethane and C fossil compressed natural gas um, has, has a kind of linear mix of those two emissions levels. Uh, and then if we go to the next slide. So this is taking an even wider picture. So here we've got the well to wheel emissions that we just saw um, in the previous slide. So that's the gray bar here. Uh, and then we've also included manufacturing emissions. Um, that's the light purple bar. And then added those together to get our final total emissions, which is the, the dark purple. Uh, and here we can see clearly gasoline has the highest emissions. Um, fossil CNG vehicles offer some emission savings. Um, and then the pure biomethane option would still have an overall uh, negative total emissions. And uh, now looking at the wider picture, we can see that the battery electric vehicle and the biomethane fossil CNG mix vehicles have a relatively similar level of emissions. Um, and that's partly driven by the fact that there are higher emissions associated with the productions of batteries. Um, than internal combustion engine vehicles. So that's the emissions uh, and now we'll move on to the costs associated with each vehicle. So what we've done in the study is uh, look, look at a range of costs across the value chain. Uh, and some of these costs are capex investments, so the manufacturer of the vehicle. Uh, and some of them are variable, so um, the fuel production, um, cost and uh, we've combined these here um, by annualizing the investment costs uh, over the lifetime of the vehicle um, and using an assumption on annual mileage for the fuel production and transport costs. Um, so what we can see when we look at the total costs is that uh, battery electric vehicles have the highest cost in 2030. Uh, and that's driven by the relatively higher manufacturing cost of the vehicle. And then of the different gas mobility options, uh, the pure biomethane option has the highest cost because it has the relatively higher fuel production cost um, for biomethane relative to uh, fossil CNG. And then the mix is, is somewhere in the middle between the pure fossil and pure biomethane value. So if we go on to the next slide. Okay, so here, um, this slide is bringing together the two components that we just looked at. So we have uh, emissions abated and the cost premium, and we bring these together to the graph on the right-hand side to give the carbon abatement cost uh, versus the gasoline reference. Um, 
So um, what this is showing is that uh, for in 2030, the battery electric vehicles um, are likely to have a, a relatively high cost of carbon abatement. And that's because uh, while they offer um, emission savings relative to gasoline, they're also relatively high cost. And then within the gas mobility options, um, the pure biomethane uh, option has the lowest carbon abatement cost, um, and that's because it, it offers um, very high uh, emission abatement relative to gasoline, um, and that that outweighs the the higher cost of the fuel relative to the other options. And the biomethane and uh, fossil CNG mix also has a relatively low carbon abatement cost. It's worth noting if we look at the graph on the, the top left um, that battery electric vehicles and um, biomethane CNG mix vehicles actually have similar levels of emission savings, but the uh, gas mobility option is significantly cheaper than the electric vehicle. So we end up with a lower cost of carbon abatement. Uh, and then finally, the CNG from fossil has a slightly higher abatement cost than the other gas mobility options because um, although it's it's the lowest cost relative to gasoline, it also offers uh, relatively lower emission savings than the other options. So when we combine this, um, we have a relatively low cost, but also relatively lower emission saving. So if we move on to the next slide, so, um, as I said earlier, uh, many of these uh, different um, parameters are quite uncertain. So what we just saw was our baseline results. Uh, and what we also do in the study is uh, include some ranges for some of the key parameters. So uh, the graphs on the left here are showing um, a selection of parameters that we that we consider and there's there's more in the study. Uh, and here we have uh, the lower bound and the upper bound for each of the vehicles and the line in the middle is our baseline value. Um, and the, the significant parameters are really the fuel production costs where uh, biomethane production cost is relatively more uncertain in 2030 um, because of uncertainty around the feedstock mix. And the vehicle manufacturing costs are also um, relatively uncertain in 2030 for electric vehicles, um, which is particularly significant because it's one of the largest components of the total costs. Um, so what we do is combine all of the different um, parameter ranges to the graph on the right. And this gives our cost sensitivity range um, for each of the vehicles. Uh, and you can see that the electric vehicles have uh, the largest um, sensitivity range, which reflects the fact that as a less mature technology, it's still uh, uncertain how the cost will develop over the next decade. So um, if we move on now to look at trucks. So here we'll go through the same thing, emissions costs and then the carbon abatement cost. So firstly, thinking about the emissions, um, here we're showing the total emissions. So we've got the well to wheel emission for each truck option. So just as a reminder, we've got the diesel, uh, fossil LNG, pure bio LNG, uh, a mix of fossil and bio LNG, and then fuel cell trucks running on gray, blue or green hydrogen, which all have different emissions levels. Um, and the, so what we've got is the well-to-wheel emissions for each option, uh, the manufacturing emissions for each option, and then these two components added together to give um, the total emissions um, for each vehicle. So clearly diesel has uh, one of the highest uh, emissions. Um, the fossil LNG then offers uh, uh, some level of uh, emission abatement relative to diesel. Um, similar to, to what we saw in the passenger cars, the uh, bio LNG option has uh, actually negative total emissions because um, of the emissions that are bound in the bio LNG production process. Uh, 
And then the fuel cell options, gray hydrogen um, actually ends up having a similar overall level of emissions to diesel. Uh, and that's because um, the uh, manufacturing emissions of fuel cells are higher than diesel. Uh, and then if we look at blue and green hydrogen, they offer um, more substantial uh, emission savings relative to diesel. Um, but um, it's worth noting that it's, uh, again, relatively uncertain um, what volumes of blue or green hydrogen will be available for use in transport in 2030. So if we move on to the costs uh, of each vehicle, so again, here we've combined um, capital costs such as the truck manufacturer um, with uh, per kilometer costs like the fuel production. And the first thing to note is um, fuel production costs are a much more significant part of the picture for trucks than for cars because they have a much higher um, annual mileage. Um, and uh, what we can see here is that um, the uh, vehicles running on a mix of bio LNG and fossil LNG um, and fuel cell trucks running on grey or blue hydrogen all have a relatively low cost uh, in terms of the total cost. While the pure bio LNG and the green hydrogen fuel cell options are relatively more expensive, and that's really driven by this higher cost of the fuel production, which, uh, as I said, has a big impact for the for the trucks. Um, and as Matthias mentioned earlier, um, there's also some uncertainty around the availability of fuel cell trucks at scale in 2030. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, so this again is bringing together um, the emissions abated and the cost premium relative to diesel on the left hand side. So that's the two uh, components we just went through um, to give an overall carbon abatement cost relative to diesel. And I'll just highlight a few points here. So the first thing to note is that LNG trucks are actually uh, lower cost than diesel and they have uh, lower emissions. Uh, so when we put that together, that gives a negative uh, carbon abatement cost for fossil LNG trucks. And then trucks running on pure bio LNG or a mix of fossil and bio LNG have a relatively low cost of carbon abatement of around 100 euro per tonne of carbon equivalent abated. Uh, and that's despite having kind of different emission and cost profiles. So the bio LNG has higher emission savings, but it's also higher cost. Um, than the mix, which has still uh, emission savings, but is lower cost. And then the cost of carbon abatement for the fuel cells um, varies quite significantly based on which type of hydrogen we're looking at. So the blue hydrogen um, option is relatively low uh, cost of carbon abatement. Um, that's because the cost of production is, is relatively low. Um, while the green hydrogen uh, has a higher cost, although it also has uh, higher emissions abated. Um, and finally, grey hydrogen, as I mentioned earlier, um, actually doesn't um, save any emissions relative to diesel. Um, and so that means it has a prohibitively high carbon abatement cost. So we've capped that here at the top of the graph, but in reality, the, the cost of carbon abatement is a uh, in a sense, um, infinite because there's there's no emissions saving. Um, so the conclusion of this is uh, that gas mobility options um, can contribute um, as part of the mix. Um, and Matthias will now talk through some high level conclusions and policy recommendations that were part of our study. Yeah, thank you very much, Amber. Um, yeah, indeed, that was a very quick run through the uh, the study, and obviously there's there's more details in the study, and we can jump into into other elements uh, in the Q A session if if, if required. Um, but to, to kind of repeat the key results of 
of the study are like in relation to gas mobility uh, that gas mobility mobility can help to contribute to reducing CO2 emissions uh, at comparably low system cost that holds for passenger uh, and heavy duty road transport. Um, that's the, the one thing. The other is gas mobility is available on a on, on vehicle, on infrastructure and on the fuel supply level and thus can contribute to um, reducing C2 emissions over the next years. What does this mean for policy? Um, like the one thing is that policy should allow for technological diversification. Um, mobility needs are very diverse um, and, and there's like lots of different technologies with different advantages and disadvantages and there's definitely no one size fits all solution. Um, and at the same time, uh, many developments uh, in the future are quite uncertain. Um, so this really means that policy should at this stage keep options open uh, and not neither implicitly nor explicitly uh, exclude any technology options that can valuably contribute to um, to the carbon uh, abatement targets. And uh, this really then calls for a, a technology neutral approach. Um, and, and such an approach would also allow gas mobility as any other renewable or low carbon technology option uh, to become part of a wide technology mix uh, to reduce transport C2 emissions quickly. So I'm th that's kind of a, a high level policy recommendation. Um, I'm sure we will dive into more concrete aspects of that in the panel discussion. Um, but at this stage, that is it from our side.